All right, it's time for another Q&A, and I got a lot of questions on my Spider-Verse digital code giveaway post. It's a post, it's a video upload. So I'm gonna go through all those questions. It will be somewhat quick answers, typical Q&A style, but other ones are really good F&A materials. That will be a separate post as well. So it'll be a quick answer, then that will say it will be an F&A. So let's uh, get into position so that there's room here. So first question is by Yuri. He asks, do you think it's important to have scenes with two or more characters in an animation reel to show that you can animate interaction? Absolutely. I think interaction is really hard to pull off. And I'm not talking interaction in terms of punching where it's like a one frame contact. So I think anything where someone is holding, pulling, pushing, uh, you know, lifting something, this could be another person, this could be also another object for that matter. But I think interaction is really hard to pull off. And uh, if you want to show off technical skills, and I think it's also interesting to animate, but I think, yes, I think that would be, you know, I, I wouldn't say it's the most important thing. I think thought process and, um, you know, character choices and just performances, believable performances with an interesting character, uh, I think that would be at the top. But I think you can incorporate interaction between two characters into your scene. So yeah, I think that is important. And I think it's a cool showcase of your technical abilities, especially if you have something with creatures where, um, you know, they're biting and holding on to each other, or if you have a human fighting creatures. The uh, Cameron Fielding's Turok reel is a good example, it's a great example, not just good, uh, of interaction between a human and the creature. All right, next question, Barb Wired Life. I know both are extremely important, but if one had the chosen, I'm gonna read it the way it's written here. Uh, if one had to chosen as most important for an animation reel, would it be technical accuracy, top-notch body mechanics, perfect lip sync, etc., or entertainment value of each shot, engaging has a little story. So I would say entertainment value. That being said, the technical accuracy needs to be top notch as well. It can, to me, it's kind of hand in hand. Basically, your basic level of animation needs to be really high from a technical point of view, unless you can start somewhere at the company as an intern, where you can just showcase more your ideas and they'll teach you more their technique and their style of animation. And then you can, you know, you can kind of learn there on the go, and it's kind of part of the training. Um, so where ideas in a reel are potentially more important. But I think other than that, I think. If you're animating, let's say for TV or movies, um, primarily I would say that the entertainment value is most important there for performance because you're watching something to be entertained versus something with game gameplay and responsiveness and transitions and all that stuff is a whole different aspect. And uh, unless you're gameplay like for cinematics and then entertainment value and storytelling um, will be more important. So I would say entertainment for sure, because you want to show thought process and through that have the viewer be entertained. But at the same time, body mechanics and lip sync and all that stuff needs to be really high as well. If you just look at uh, show reels of schools, um, that's kind of your top of the top. If you want to compare yourself to other students, like that's your minimum technical um, level that you should be striving for. If that's an English sentence, I can remember what I even said. Um, so that would be your minimum. But then on top of that, everything should be you know, package into something really entertaining. And by entertaining, I mean, it could be something really sad, really happy, really, you know, whatever, whatever the stories that you want to tell, even within a one shot thing. So entertainment doesn't have to be just gags and slapstick. Nishant Green. As always, I apologize if I mispronounce, I'm going to try my best. Um, what's the pros and cons between blocking and splocking? It's interesting. Uh, I haven't seen that word. Um, a lot online. Uh, every now, every, when I see it, it's usually referred to starting your blocking already in spline mode. So if you're in Maya, you're you might not be stepped or linear or whatever as your default. So you start right away splines. Um, so the pros and cons. Um, I think I would give my my BS answer of it depends. Uh, for those that are my students, they know that's my one of my favorite useless answers. It's, it depends. Uh, so I would say it depends on your workflow. So it depends what works better for you. I have my default tangents to linear because um, we don't do step that work. So it's linear, but I right away change them to spline. And if you've watched my Q and A's, I probably said this many, many times that I should probably just default to spline right away and just change the, some keys that I want to linear. So I don't know why I haven't done this yet. It's ridiculous after 15 years, but I just do everything linear. And then mainly so that like footsteps and stuff like that is still hard. Uh, so it's not all spliny and I feel like everything spliny will be too crazy. But at the same time, when I start linear, everything looks really bad, but I do it on purpose. A, also because of work, but to me, 
I like to get into the right timing right away and I want to see how horrible the animation looks right away. I don't want to be fooled by good looking animation, which sometimes step mode can fool you into thinking that's going to be okay. And then you spline it, then you go, what is this? So pros and cons, um, can't really say. It depends really on your, um, on your workflow and what you prefer. So if you go blocking, meaning in stepped, maybe for you, the, pro, the pros are that everything is pose-based at the very beginning, and then you add more breakdowns in between, then you get more into the timing of it. So maybe for you, you prefer to start with very clear poses. Um, someone else might just start with blocking if it's, again, all spliny and, and it's kind of, you know, moving in a crazy way. Maybe, maybe the advantage for that person is that you have to get a grip of the right timing right away. Maybe that, I mean, that's my, my pro. Uh, aspect of it um yeah that's all i can kind of say it's a good question though i mean i'm actually curious who has who does blocking with spline right away so if that's something that you do uh who's watching this maybe leave a comment and let me know why like why you're doing this what are your thoughts behind it and why you're doing this uh, in terms of like, what are the benefits for you? So it's a good question. I don't really have a clear answer, so I do apologize. Hannah Novotny, I think that's it. Uh, how do you fix or combat knee pops in 3D animation? That's a pain. Um, well, it depends what you do. I mean, you might have stretchy legs. You might have a specific con that just kind of moves the knee around. So a stretchy leg, as in the whole leg kind of stretches, or it's a knee control that I kind of, you can pull the knee around, which then elongates the, the leg. You can adjust the hips. Uh, there's like an overall like root controller polishing. I think, you know, foot roll depends on the action, depends what you do, especially on walk cycles. And there are a lot of separate tools and, and then it also kind of depends on the rig setup. So there might be ways on a really advanced rig and a rig that's really basic. You might just have to go with foot roll and hips and root adjustment and changing your poses and um, again, not that not a great clear answer. It really depends on the tools and the type of animation. The tricky thing is when you have to go in there frame by frame, because then you have to be really precise. Otherwise, you got that little high frequency jitter uh, and knee pops and stuff like that. So, um, how do you fix it with a lot of pain, depending on your setup? Avins, Ivins, I had you as a student, and I should remember how to pronounce your first name. And I apologize for not knowing. I would say Ivins, Avins. Sorry. Do you often reuse animation at ILM? No. Um, that being said, there might be something in a mocap library where you use that take, that mocap take, and you work from there. Like a lot of times, I would say most of the times, but anyways, most of the times, uh, mocap is being tweaked. It's so rare that you just get mocap and go, oh, that's it. I mean, that never happens. But maybe you get mocap and that's it, part two, and then you change fingers and feet. But most of the times you gotta tweak it because you get client notes and it's gonna change anyway. So a lot of times you also use mocap and then ends up being just reference. Like that's a good beginning, but I gotta do everything else from scratch. So that's kind of how it's supposed to look in a realistic way. And then you just do the whole thing keyframe. Uh, and in terms of reuse, it would be reusing the takes, the mocap takes. Uh, in terms of actual animation that you reuse, it would be something like a library, someone has like a, a wing flap on a creature or something that is the basis of something else. But straight up copy pasting, not really. It's always so dependent on the shot and you always make the shot work specifically to that camera or the camera relationship to the plate or the actor in the plate. So uh, how often you reuse, maybe someone has and got away with it, which is great because that saves time. Uh, in production, you do want to save time but you ultimately still want to make it look like it has not been reused. So uh, I would say how often, pretty much never. Khan, Khan, how does one stop the surging, sliding? By the way, if anybody listens to this and doesn't watch this, I say Khan because the username is Khan, but I could just throw out random Star Trek moments. So Khan says, how does one stop the surging and sliding effect when animating tentacles? You know, we had that for a while at work. Um, it really depends on your setup where you might grab something and maybe grab the root or the hip or whatever the creature is. And then however your splines are formed, the, the tentacle kind of slides back and forth. I'm assuming that's what you mean. Um, but then we have a tool that does it sticky. So depending on your, on your nodes, the whole thing might be sticky or you have just sections that are sticky and the rest stretches. So how do you stop that? It really depends on the setup and the rig that you have. 
or um, frame by frame. I mean, so much can be fixed uh, by frame by frame uh, process, but it's a pain and it gets jittery. So it's not like something I would recommend. Worst case scenario, that's something you could do. Uh, so yeah. Arthur asks, how you fix elbow in VFX movie if you need to keep it at same position? I mean, most VFX rigs doesn't have options to control it itself and they are very limited. Sorry if this is unclear. It's not, it's basically fixing elbows. Again, we have tools that lock down knees and elbows. So it's just like before, either you have a tool that does it or you do it frame by frame, <laughs> which again, there's a, a very probability, like high probability of, of uh, high frequency jitter. So it could be a pain again, so there's always, um, a technical question is always, well, either you have a tool and then it's great or through a lot of painful work that takes time. So it's kind of my, my BS answer there. Andrion Becker, Andrion, Andrion Becker. As someone who has been able to stay at ILM for such a long time, what do you think distinguishes you from other animators who were only kept on for one or two projects? What advice would you give to those looking to stick around? It's a tricky question, especially in my case, because I started as an intern and I was cheap. So the incentive to keep me around was I didn't cost a lot of money. Definitely more expensive now. So I'm trying to offset that with speed. Uh, I don't think I'm a slow animator, it depends on the shot. Um, so I think speed is definitely good. I mean, price obviously is a big thing. So if you're super cheap, you know, they're gonna keep you around. Um, so the more you ask for raises, the more expensive you get, you wanna offset that obviously with more skills. So A, animation would be one thing. So obviously trying to be a good animator, I'm not gonna say I'm a good animator. I, I work really hard to try to be, and every now and then the shot looks okay. Um, so I would say, I just try to work hard in terms of the technical aspect. So uh, what advice would you give to, uh, to those looking to stick around? The multiple things. Workflow and speed, and obviously making the shots look good. Trying to expand your skill set to go beyond animation, looking ahead. So, what would um, an animator do at that company, being a lead or a soup, and then looking at, well, do I need to know more um, about like simulations in terms of destroying things, or creating tools, or um, being better at camera work and creating movies from scratch, so you can do previous or post with uh, this work. Um, and then it will be sharing your uh, work. So if you have any tools or you have libraries or anything that helps the, the, the project, share it. So don't hold on like a vampire. Oh, this is like vampire. I was gonna say like a cape and you hide, I don't know, sharing and holding on vampire. That makes no sense. Never mind. So if you have anything that is useful to the team, share it. So you don't want to keep things to yourself. You want to make sure that other people can benefit from it, which again will improve production workflow and speed, I mean, again, speed equals less money spent. So that will be helpful. Also, just your general attitude. Um, like don't, if you're hard to work with, it's a problem with crewing. Like you might still get picked because you're there, but it's like dodgeball, you get picked at the end or something. So basically if you get notes and they're tricky notes or they're annoying notes or notes that will, that will destroy your shot, which can happen, you will still take those notes, go, okay, and then just do them. If you are resisting notes or, or you know, refusing to do notes, that's a problem that slows down production that makes you kind of difficult to work with. Um, so uh, there's an aspect of being able to work within a team and respecting your position at the company. So if you're, are, if you're an animator, you get notes, you do the notes. If you're an animator that creates more and better things, you share with the team. Um, so that would be, that would be my my list. I'm sure there's more, but uh, and in terms of what distinguished me, I think I mean I started my first movie was Star Wars, and I'm a Star Wars fan, so I think my fanboyism helped with being enthusiastic about the show. I was picky about details, and and again I was cheap. I was an intern, so I think not complaining, being driven, and enthusiastic, um, and you know I was I was lucky that I, I was given good shots to learn where I've never done creature stuff, never done camera work, never done mocap. So with Star Wars, there's such a variety that I got a lot of shots to practice on in a way. So I think that was, I was very fortunate to have that. And through that was like a, a nice slow learning curve. I wasn't thrown into like Alberto and Jair. They were um, two people from uh, Mentor that started on Transformers 4, I believe. Uh, and Transformers movies are tough in terms of the technical aspects and what you have to do. So to have that as your first show, holy moly. So it's a trial by fire. 
Um, so I had it much easier in terms of how I started. So starting on something else, like a Transformers movie might be much more difficult and tricky. So I would say I was lucky. I wouldn't say something distinguished me. I was just pretty lucky in terms of what I got. Um, and then those are the things that I mentioned. But I think being able to improve your skill set and looking ahead and seeing what benefits the team and the production and the company and being, you know, a good team player, uh, the cliche thing to say, um, just you know, being easy to work with is also a big factor. All right, I think that should be it. Daniel Pira, Pira, Pira. Do you think animators should learn and implement more technical things into their animation like dynamics and muscle simulation? Well, that goes back into the other question, the previous question, I would say yes. Not at the beginning, I would say, um, so if you're talking about uh, students, I would just focus on animation, just primarily that's your thing and storytelling and character and performance. Later on, you know, once your animation stuff is really good, dynamics and muscle simulation for sure. Unless you want to be a generalist and you want to learn all this at the same time, that's also a valid answer. And if you are a professional and you are animating at a company, that is definitely something to look forward to in terms of expanding your skill set, like I said in the, like I answered in the previous question. So do you think they should learn it? I think, well, if you like it, for sure. If you're starting out with animation, I would say not yet. Just look at the principles and really master the basics and then go into what could you do to supplement your animation, and make things more interesting, like dynamics. And I mean, you can do lots of destructions and muscle simulation, creature stuff and camera work. You can make some really cool looking shots. So, but don't neglect the basics. L asks, should you consider paying the high tuition to go to an art school to learn computer animation or is it more money efficient to self-teach or do online courses? Basically, will you learn more, be prepared more going to college or studying online? That's a tricky question. It really depends on your situation. So A, you have to look at the cost. And there was a recent hubbub online about, I think it was CalArts in terms of the tuition prices. So if you can afford all of that stuff and you feel like the teachers there and the, the course material is beneficial to you, go for that. If you're looking in terms of, you know, cost, efficiency, I mean, online schools are cheaper, uh, all taught by professionals. I mean, it's very, it's very streamlined, focused education, which uh, and then also I teach at Animation Mentors. I would recommend that because it does help and I see how uh, students improve. So I think that would be very valuable also because if you're in a different country, you can learn online easier than to move somewhere and then all the costs involved with housing and everything and going to school and supplies and all that stuff. At the same time, art school, um, I went to the Academy of Arts, so I had a general Bachelor of Fine Arts education and that helped me in terms of just a general overview. I didn't have all the you know art school classes and, and you know color and design, all that stuff uh, in high school or college in Switzerland. So I think that as a general education, I think I liked it, it benefited me. But at the same time, being a foreigner, I needed it to have the requirements to apply for a work visa. So I don't know how it is now, I'm not up to date, it's been, it's been so long. But for an H1B back then, you needed a bachelor's or a master's. So depends if you have the money and then you feel like all the whole, you know, art school, the whole thing might help you, like package wise, the whole thing would be great. I would say go for it. But again, it costs and uh, you have to look at logistics, you have to move there versus online schools are cheaper. It's easier to, to the access is obviously easier. Um, but like I said, if you're a foreigner, you might have to you go there because of uh, work visa issues and stuff like that. Ryan Olson asks, what's the greatest aha moment you've had while working at ILM that took your animation to a whole nother level? That's a good question. And to be honest, I don't know. There are so many multiple things that happened <laughs> where you pick something up, but I think an aha moment, it's a tricky question. I think it was more just the exposure to all the work, seeing that in dailies, having animation meetings where people explain their tools and their process, um, having, you know, specialized training. When I started uh, Star Trek, I got more, um, you know, a bigger education and training in terms of camera work, which I've never done. So to me, like an aha moment from a, for a very specific aspect, that show was big for cameras. And I love doing camera animation. Um, but I was never exposed to that type of thing at school. So I think that was, it wasn't like an aha moment in terms of general animation, but it was something where, oh, that specifically, that's cool, now I get it. Um, but then you have shows that push certain elements where um, creature-wise or mechanics-wise are, you know, the aha moment. So I think the greatest, I can't really answer that, the greatest aha moment. 
maybe piggybacking on the previous thing, I think the biggest aha moment was not in terms of making animation better, but seeing seeing how the whole thing works, like behind the scenes, the curtain, behind the curtain type of thing of, oh, this is what you do for this type of movie, these type of shots, this is what you need to present. This is how you work with clients. This is how you have to act in dailies and in meetings. And I think the aha moment was just starting there as in, oh, this is what it is to be an animator versus a student. Also, seeing all the making ofs and now seeing how it's done. Oh, that making of is staged. This is not really true. That article kind of sugarcoats this process. So I think I think it's a whole combination of multiple things. But I'm gonna hold on to that question and potentially do something specific. I gotta think about that longer. Um, so it's just animation related in terms of techniquing and what did I get that made it better. I think that. I'm going to ponder that longer and then do something separate one day, hopefully, maybe. Hope that was somewhat of an okay answer. 13 R and O R Aaron Rodriguez. Uh, sorry, it was a, a long username there. As an animator looking for the first gig, what is an optimal way to approach an animation test for a studio? Are there even universal approaches uh, approaches to anim tests? So that was on Twitter, and I kind of responded um, with a, with a question. My thing was. I th maybe game and indie studios type of thing. That was the, the 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 discussion that we had there. They demand tests. The only test that I know of was Blue Sky way back by someone who asked me about it, uh, who did the test for it. Um, I don't know about ILM doing tests or asking for tests. I don't know about other companies. So this might be a whole feature company. No, except some exceptions maybe. And then maybe game room companies. Yes. Um, so I think. In general, it's if you have the test, I think the biggest thing would be read the requirements and follow those requirements. Don't try to do more. I think they want to see, can you do what we ask you to do within a certain time limit? I think that's a big test. So uh, my lack of experience with those informs this answer. So meaning I don't really know, but if I had to say a, something general, it would be look at the requirements for the test, make sure everything is answering those questions in terms of your animation, however, the, whatever the questions are. Um, and that will be it. All right. Vanessa is asking, how do you switch between IK FK when there isn't a seamless switch built into the rig? Well, there are a couple ways. You can uh, gradually switch so you don't feel the pop. So you have your IK switch over a couple of frames, and then so it's more of like uh, you know you uh, you move and then it goes into whatever you want to grab, hold on to, or you're leaning on something and getting off of it, and that could be uh, over a slow progression or you hide it through something fast. So if you go and you hold on to something, that might be the switch over here, bam, over one frame, so that you don't see the pop because it's hidden in that quick move, a quick action, whatever the you know the thing is that you're animating. So to me, it would be uh, a slow, gradual thing, so it kind of hides the pop, or you just mask the pop by something fast where the, the move itself has a pop in it, in a way, so to speak. Um, but then, you know, they always have some rigs that have a really good IKFK switcher and an FK match and stuff like that. So as always, kind of depends on the tool. But if you don't have the tool, like the question here, I would say those are the two things that I can think of. That's a crazy username. Uh, Somic Star Slump God. Sorry, this is a crazy name. Um, but that person asked, what programs do you mainly use to animate? And that's a quick answer. It is Maya. We use Maya at work and I use Maya at home. And that's all I know. Ross Brown, what classic animated films are still a go-to for new animators to watch and absorb the techniques? That's a great question, and that's something I should probably do as an FNA in terms of like inspirations, and that's something you should potentially watch. Um, so I'm not gonna, I wanna ponder again, this is another question I wanna ponder, but generally, it kinda depends on your style. Um, obviously, if you do stuff in CG, I would look at CG movies in general, see kinda the history and see where it goes. But at the same time, I would still go back to the classics, but maybe that's also something where it's your know, personal preference. Um, to me, I mean, all the old Disney classic movies and Dalmatians and, and Cinderella and Snow White and Jungle Book and Aladdin. And I mean, there's so many that I think in terms of appeal and movement and performance are so good. But then at the same time, I would look at, you know, classics like go all the way back to Toy Story, Toy Story 2, Monster saying, I love all those movies. They're so great. So to me, it would be you can you can always go superficially in terms of what act, uh, go online and check the top ten animated movies, and that's always a great list. 
But then you also go into like the Secret of Nim, like some other movies where there might not be the classic Disney thing where it's more Don Bluth, um, you know, the American Tale. Um, I don't know, there's so many others. Then you can look at more the European parts where uh, it's just a different style. And then anime and it, I mean, there's so much you can look at. So it kind of, again, depends on your style, like what kind of animation are you interested in? And you look at that and then look at the history of that and look into that research. Um, so it kind of depends on your preferences. But I think in general, it's it's good to look at all kinds of techniques and styles and movies from different countries to get you just an overall animation um, education in terms of what has been done. Um, so classic animated films, I would say all of them. <laughs> the big ones, you know, from the big companies and, and studio Ghibli, 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 how you pronounce it. Um, so there's so many good ones. Um, so if you press for time, you could look at what are the considered to be the top 10 and go from there. And if you have more time, expand. It's a long answer, but um, I think it, will, it would be an interesting f &A to look at specific movies, classic movies, and pick out specific scenes, which again is very subjective, but where I feel like that's a cool moment. Like to me, like Jungle Book, where Mowgli's on the tree and has the holding on, and then the legs kind of go up and he stretches his legs to go back up. Like there's some scenes like this that are, that are so cool. Um, but Dalmatians comes to mind there. There's a lot of like cloth interaction in terms of the craftsmanship of how a person does something where it's like a general, like a natural move while performing. I don't know, there's so many good moments. So long, long answer, uh, I would say I'm gonna do an FNA and look at classics and then pick out certain scenes that to me subjectively uh, are of value, if that makes sense. Okay, Numako999 asks, how do you plan your breakdowns for short and wide spacing? Same timing, it's an interesting question. How do you plan your breakdowns for short and wide spacing, same timing? I think, because I'm so used to the workflow at work where, you know, sometimes the research is a bit heavier and I, basically I go through everything through the viewport as in the render view. I don't really manipulate that much uh, through the graph editor, unless the scene is light and the rig is light. So to me, how do I apply my breakdowns? I mean, I look at acting things out, shooting reference, uh, potentially just writing things down, not really thumbnailing because I'm really not good at it. So planning my breakdowns, I just go, it's a tricky question because with the short and wide spacing, same timing, basically, maybe the, hopefully that answers, but I do keying the full character every four frames with general timing. So it's kind of okay. And then I move the, the ticks in the timeline, Maya, to really adjust the timing to be more specific and so it, it works better. And then I do layer and I do controller, in fact, controllers or root chest head and, and extremities and stuff. So that's kind of that's kind of how I plan my breakdowns. I have the main keys and then I look at, it's more mentally and based on my reference and the acting out. Okay, this breakdown is based on this acting choice and this movement and this timing. So then I'm gonna put um, you know, the, the breakdown that tells the story best in terms of how slow you get out of the pose or specific pose or whatever you have. Um, and that's kind of how I go about it. And that will be all generally timed. And then I re jiggle the timing and then go controller by controller. I think that answers maybe how do you plan your breakdowns for short and wide spacing? To be honest, maybe I'm just too stupid and I don't understand the question. <laughs> so I don't know. Hopefully this answers, probably not. So maybe ask me again. I should have probably, I should have re responded with a, uh, uh, how would you really mean? So anyway, this is my general answer and hopefully answers the question. If not, ask me again in the comments and we can go through it and I can answer it again. Armando Carrillo, if that's how you pronounce it. When working on a feature film with many animators working at once, what do you have to keep in mind when animating to stay consistent with the other animation work, even if guided to do something differently? Well, you basically look at the sequence, look at the shots before and after, depending if there's a whole sequence available. So you kind of do your own prep and homework where you're like, oh, this is what people did. And then we just stay within those acting choices or the movements or the weight or the creature behavior. And then at the same time, if you're an animator, you're gonna have a lead that's gonna take care of that. You're gonna have a supervisor that takes care of that. And hopefully the client takes care of that too. So I think there are a lot of fail safe uh, mechanisms in place to make that work. Every now and then, I guess, you know, there could be time constraints where you just gotta do something and then you just gotta go for movement and just that animation needs to work and then that's it. And then, you know, time runs out and it's final. So maybe every now and then the shot can slip through where it's not quite 
in character. Well, um, that's basically the uh, the approach. That, I mean, at least that we have, which means I can't really reply in terms of feature animation since I haven't worked there. But I've seen I saw a presentation once from was it Moana? I think it was Moana where they had a storyboard with a uh, like an emotional beat tracker type of thing where it just showed this is her headspace at any given time in the sequence so you know where she's hopeful and angry and desperate and happy and it always kind of showed on the on the graph or something like that where it shows where she's at so if you do get a new shot you see exactly what her state of mind is and I think that's really cool so as always my bs entropy depends depends on where you work what the company is and their flow but i think there's always someone there uh, helping you and if not then it's just something that you have to do and you have to take notes and look at the whole sequence if you have that to see how a character behaves and make hopefully make it hit. Sam Bowen asks do you plan your timing ahead of a shot as they would on a dope sheet or do you get into posing first and then find the timing as you move into breakdowns? It's a good question and again I'm gonna do an FNA in terms of just my workflow but again in general um, I don't really plan the timing ahead of a shot I think to me it's more general posing but i like to make the poses better once it's all there it's basically very rough idea in terms of timing it's more about the storytelling poses and just what you want to do in terms of acting choices or creature movement and then once i have that in place then i refine the timing and once the timing works whatever you're doing then i go and really polish the poses so i know this is the timing this is how it's supposed to move Okay, but at this point, let's push this post to really drive home the point of that story point or whatever it is. Uh, and that's kind of my approach. It's kind of like chiseling away on a big block of animation and slowly again making it better. I'm not the type that goes into, here's my pose, and it's a perfect pose. Here's the next pose, perfect pose. Now I think about the breakdowns in between and then about the timing. So to me, it's more general timing, but everything is somewhat clear in terms of story. Then I adjust the timing so it looks and feels right and then posing and so let's push this where it, where you can but sometimes you have fast movement where stuff is blurry and things are moving around where you could slave away on a pose but you're not going to read it anyway because it's, it's blurred or it's fast or whatever and then there are moments where the sh where the, the the shot slows down or the animation slows down and that's a good moment where the blur is reduced and then you want to push your poses so to me that's kind of the approach i want to see how things move how fast and where they are depending on the camera and the sets and everything and then i have a better a better overview bigger overview in terms of there are these are the moments where i can push the pose versus putting in poses and then later on realizing oh we don't see it anyway or there's a big shadow we won't see that so i want to get an overview of where the character is in relationship to the set the camera and the movement and the speed and the motion blur and everything and then push my pose in. that makes sense random comments that's the username that's just me saying this um is that a galaxy of adventures t-shirt can we get a better look uh it looks really cool uh that's right i wore this so oh there's a that's a long one here's the <laughs> acting to camera not knowing looking at the screen here what i'm doing so here's let me get up here there you go that was a better look at it he also has a question um, or she, I don't know, it's a random comment. Uh, how, why does one decide the range of colors to use in a project? Obviously things are usually either black and white or full color, but there are shades which seem to define a film sometimes and probably shades which aren't present. Particularly since Spider-Verse is such a bright and colorful film and has so many competing styles to bled together, to blend together probably. Um, can't really answer that. I think the general thing would be Obviously, the director has an overall vision of what to do. There's you got your your concept artist, and you got your storyboarders, you got your um, production designers. I mean, everybody has a bit of a uh, you know an idea of what to do. But then you have the cinematographer that might also have certain ideas in terms of coloring. But you're gonna have color keys. I mean, there's an artist responsible for that. You get a general mood with your color keys, um, and then the concept designer with the, with uh, the creatures or the humans or whatever characters. You got production designers in terms of the sets. I mean. It all comes in from many, many places uh, and ultimately, hopefully, the director or someone has a singular vision to then decide that. And at the end, when your whole movie is done, there's, you still go into color uh, correction and then you do your DI and, and then you do your tweaking on a shot-by-shot -shot basis, looking at the, the flow of the sequence. And obviously, this whole process is totally different if it's live action or uh, fully animated. So 
uh, lots of answers. I'm not uh, involved in that process, hence my wishy-washy answer there. I'm not in that position to decide on colors. The only time would be, you know, if we create a shot from scratch, be it previous or post viz where, you know, you do something and you add specific elements, but that's just, to me, I think of color then in terms of silhouette and guiding the eye to something, but I don't want to tell the person downstream in terms of lighting and, and, and texturing and compositing what to do. Like that's their feel, I want to step on their toes. So, so to me, if I do anything in terms of color, it's just to make the shot um, look clean and clear for a presentation and as a general indication of where what is, if I create something from scratch. But most of the times, either we have a plate or if it's something that's CG, it's still based on concept work and I just replicate the colors from there and then so on and so on. So that's kind of, that's kind of it. All right, well, that is it for another part. I have so many more questions that were based on that uh, Spider-Verse giveaway post. So this should be shorter-ish, probably, I don't know, this could be half an hour, 40 minutes maybe. So the next one's gonna be probably much longer. I might have to do two more because there were so many questions. So this might be a multi-part thing. And I'm probably gonna post this uh, either over the weekends or during the week and have it not part of a Thursday, Friday acting analysis FNA release because I wanna get back to FNAs in terms of animation technique. So look forward to more of those Q&A answers. So if your question has been answered yet, it's coming. It's gonna come during the week and not on the Thursday, Friday blocks. And that is it. So this is obviously a longer clip so if you watch this whole thing you know my spiel and i do mean it i do mean it that i am grateful that you watched the whole thing if you have any questions about these you need more clarification so you want follow-up questions or you were the one that asked this question and my answer was ridiculous and you want to ask again feel free um if this was helpful and you liked it you know the spiel like subscribe hit that bell button all that good stuff that people ask you to do on youtube and that is it thank you for watching